Absolutely. Okay. Hello and uh, welcome again to Kahali and this time around we're going to be discussing something very interesting and I have the perfect person to discuss this with, Ambassador Rajiv Dogra. Of course, uh, you all know him, those of you who visit our channel often. And um, Ambassador Dogra, I just want to dive right into it, not give too much of an introduction, but um, just to explain to our viewers uh, in the simplest of terms, what is going on in Ukraine? Because finally, Putin has referred to it as a war. Till up, up till now, it was always being referred to as a crisis, the Ukrainian crisis. So uh, can you just give us a little background on this before we discuss the topic of the day? So, so you want me to add another Kahani to your Kahani? <laughs> yes, just for you know our viewers, because it is somewhere in our consciousness, but we've obviously not focused on it quite as much as uh, we should, really. Well, Advita, to, to start uh, on a personal note, uh, when I was uh, uh, in the External Affairs Ministry in Delhi, uh, first as Joint Secretary, then as Additional Secretary, uh, I was handling both Russia and Ukraine. So uh, even at that time, I could uh, see in their uh, diplomats a kind of uh, a friction. You know, uh, even when they were together in a room, uh, it wasn't uh, uh, bonhomie. I mean, uh, you, you have countries uh, where relations aren't the best, but at least when their diplomats meet, they don't make it so obvious that, uh, you know, they don't like the sight of the other guy's face. But in case of Russian and Ukrainian diplomats, uh, this seemed to be quite apparent. I mean, it, it seemed uh, they, they left uh, nothing to imagination. So uh, the bad feelings were inherent in the fact that Russia always felt that Ukraine was a part of it and it should not have been given away in an impulsive uh, moment by President Yeltsin mm -hmm. at that time. Uh, so mm -hmm. that feeling lingered uh, and eventually in 2014, uh, President Putin uh, ordered the operation which resulted in Russia taking over Crimea. Uh, I, Russia... I might be interesting to point out at this time that during Boris Yeltsin's time is really when Putin uh, was a sort of a lowly intelligence official, but moved into the Kremlin uh, during that uh, phase. So he would have actually seen this handover of Ukraine taking place. Well, uh, Putin was uh, an intel KGB intelligence officer uh, posted in East Germany. And he saw the mm -hmm. fall of the Berlin Wall and then East Germany getting amalgamated into West Germany. So you can say at some, some uh, subconscious mind, there was always this feeling that, okay, if uh, uh, two brothers have parted, they can always come together. So uh, uh, as a long shot, uh, one can say that uh, his taking over of Crimea uh, was uh, a part of uh, the same rhythm. Uh, that if it can happen to East Germany, why not uh, to, to uh, Crimea uh, coming together with uh, Russia? Because Russians have always believed, and in fact, Kissinger said this uh, in an article, uh, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, in 2018, where he said for 200 years, Ukraine has been a part of Russia. Ukraine was always Russian. So uh, if they took over mm -hmm. Crimea, so what? I mean, that is... Uh, going back to the motherland. So the, the history, uh, if seen from the Russian point of view and history as being told uh, over the centuries supports what Putin had done in 2014. But then there is the other point of view taken from the Ukraine uh, Ukrainian side. And Ukraine maintains that, you know, once we parted, so be it. Why go back in time and uh, then revisit uh, chapters which have been closed? Putin, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when Yeltsin uh, was the president, uh, was a deputy to the mayor of St. Petersburg. So you're quite right. 
that he was not high up in the bureaucratic echelon after he had left KGB and so on and joined uh, as a civilian officer in uh, St. Petersburg. But Yeltsin saw him uh, a, a couple of times in Moscow, also in St. Petersburg, and took a liking to him. So first he brought him uh, in Moscow as uh, his own uh, sort of uh, aide, still junior. But over time, and a very quick over time, uh, he, he felt that this is the man I should hand over uh, my, my power to as a successor. So uh, wow. Putin's rise was dramatic and Putin fitted into the job very well because, mind you, Russia at that time was down to the last penny. It could not even afford to give salary to its military uh, mm -hmm. personnel. It could not, as an oil-rich country, it could not even give uh, gasoline to its fighter planes to fly because there was no money in the uh, state exchequer. But over the period of uh, time, over years, uh, Putin uh, made a remarkable turnaround for his country. Uh, and it has been a success story. Uh, it's a different thing what has happened on 25th February and thereafter. Uh, there are various points of view and there has been suffering both in Ukraine and Russia, of which we can talk uh, as we go along. Right, right. And, uh, um, you know, like coming down to uh, what's happening right now, most recently uh, we saw India's, of course, maintained, uh, you know, a seizing of hostility stance and that India supports peace, uh, that those have been sort of the public pronouncements. We've also walked a very tight rope walk uh, between Russia and the Western world, which is sort of, uh, you know, and the anti-Russia camp and the pro-Ukraine camp. Uh, Ambassador, how how difficult has this been diplomatically for the Modi government in the last uh, so many months that this conflict has been on? Well, I think uh, you, you put your finger on, on uh, the critical uh, point in this relationship that Look, India, India has friendly relations, close relations with both sides, with Russia as well as with the West. So it was a, a, a sort of a tough balancing act to, to keep the relations going while looking after your own interests. And the basic interest was the energy issue. Uh, West wanted India and China not to buy oil and gas from Russia. Uh, because then the sanctions would have been complete if India and China also joined in with the West. But mm -hmm. India, I mean, China in any case said uh, uh, point blank, no. And uh, uh, West could not uh, pressurize China any further. As far as India is concerned, there was tremendous pressure in the beginning. But India held firm. And the basic argument was that, look, we have to look take care of our national interest. If we don't buy from Russia, which is a country which is prepared to give us oil at a discounted price, a heavily discounted mm -hmm. price, then it means that we will spend billions buying it from elsewhere for no reason as, at all except to please uh, the, the uh, Western uh, desire. So India explained this and in any case, West had nothing to offer on its plate. I mean, it would have been a different story if America, for example, said that, look, if you're buying it from Saudi Arabia at, uh, let's say, $30 more, we are prepared to underwrite the entire expenditure. That means we'll mm -hmm. uh, subsidize it by billions of dollars every month and uh, every year and so on. But that they were not prepared to do. Nor would India have accepted such an offer because India does not seek support and financial support any longer. A couple of years back, India had decided that we will not go out stretching our hand to the world for any aid or any financial help. We are self-sufficient. So the, the reason that India put forward was that we, look, we have to look after our people. We have to take care of our national interests and our national interests demand that we should buy our energy from whosoever gives us the best offer. Over a period of time, the West understood and now that is 
a closed chapter. The West understood, but um, but how do you feel? How do you think they felt? You know, having having worked through the country and of this present uh, situation, what do you what do you think of uh, uh, the? I've I've lost your voice a little bit, but uh, I I think I've got the gist of your your question. Uh, it was a, a bit of a blow to the West because, uh, especially America, uh, because when you are a superpower, you tend to uh, operate and behave as if your word would be everyone's command. So the first uh, sort of uh, i would say mild shock was their discovery that except for western countries the rest of the world was not really prepared to to the american line on this issue on issue of sanctions against uh, russia uh, the mm. second uh, discovery was that america has stretched the sanctions line far too much presently there are over 10000 countries entities and companies and individuals whom america has sanctioned they stretch from iran to russia and to many other countries uh, in the world and when you sanction as many as 10000 plus entities and countries that means you do not have trade relations with them and if you expect other countries also to follow the line and stop having any trade relations with those 10000 countries you were expecting a lot of sacrifice from those countries so when it came to russia the rest of the world non western world felt that america is stretching it a bit too far and when a country like india which has a standing of its own in the world uh also uh, uh, ex uh, express reservations on the issue of energy sanctions and so on uh it it was a bit of an unpleasant surprise to the west but then they realized that there is logic in what uh, india is saying and what others are also following hmm. and and the country that sort of taken note of india's line uh has been the country where you've been as well served as well pakistan in fact imran khan very often <laughs> refers to this and says that look at modi you know he stands up for the interests of his country and look at us <laughs> so that's uh, you know a praise coming from unexpected quarters when it comes to this position absolutely and uh, imran khan is no great friend of india uh, yeah and has his record testifies that if if he had a choice and if he had the option he would throw the first cricket ball against india uh, but yes uh, even imran khan has realized that what india has done by standing its ground is the right choice for a self respecting country and it has also stood india well because india has gained financially so even if a dim wit like imran khan realizes this that means uh, a, a huge bonus point for india an yeah. indian policy right and now coming to uh, zelensky and uh, the phone call which is what really we wanted to discuss today uh, india has of course taken over the premiership of the g20 for the next one year this is a revolving uh, presidency which different countries uh, uh, take hold of uh, when their turn comes around uh, how significant can it be uh, can how significant a role rather can india play in this conflict zelensky seems to have uh, you know sort of made the first moves on that and said that this is an expectation that he definitely and his country definitely come with going into the g20 uh, presidency well uh, a couple of things you very rightly said that uh, g20 uh, chair is a rotating chair uh, which transfers from one member country to the other uh, every year indonesia was the last one and there there were others uh, 
Brazil, Turkey, and the entire lot, and uh, the, the Western world also uh, had uh, the G20 chair uh, when their turn came. So there's nothing special as such mm-hmm. about being the chair of G20. And uh, uh, one should also not expect too much because the last time G20 acted well was when the financial crisis of 2008 and 9 uh, mm-hmm. struck the world. Then G20 acted in uh, concert and uh, some of the countries, especially America and others who were most affected by that uh, banking disaster, uh, had to put in trillions of dollars. And I remember uh, at that time, I think the chair was with England and the leaders turned to Dr. Manmohan Singh for advice on how to handle this crisis. the reason why I'm saying this is that India, whether it was Dr. Manmohan Singh or Pandit Nehru or Indira Gandhi or Mr. Vajpayee or now Mr. Modi, uh, India always has had uh, an image of an unbiased player in the international affairs. Uh, mm-hmm. A player who does not want uh, a share of the cake in a crisis like Russia, Ukraine but wants the cake to be distributed equitably uh, when it comes to negotiations or when it comes to solving the issue or when it comes to getting peace between two countries. So, number one, uh, there is trust that India will be a fair player uh, who who will push forward the road to peace uh, and will not have a stake in the game for personal uh, benefit. So uh, that that is the background to why Putin first, Putin rang up uh, Mr. Modi a couple of days back, uh, about 10 days back, if I'm not mistaken. And then Zelensky rang up. And there were also hints by other uh, countries, including by USA, that, uh, you know, India has a role to play in this uh, uh, issue. The remarkable thing is that Zelensky, to begin with, was not very sort of uh, uh, pro-India in his statements uh, after the special operation by Russia started. uh, Mm -hmm. In March, April, he had expressed uh, certain reservations. And especially when India abstained in some of the votes in the United Nations. So he was quite vocal about it. For him to come around and take the initiative in saying that uh, India can help uh, resolve this issue uh, Mm. is is, uh, quite an interesting development. Uh, Ambassador, but Ukraine has actually not been very supportive of India's positions in the UN either when it comes to voting on certain issues. So it's not like we've had any sort of long-standing relationship or equation with them. You are absolutely right. And I found it to my uh, horror that Ukraine was not very supportive, even in those days, uh, Mm -hmm. 10 years back or 12 years back. Uh, But in international affairs, in a diplomatic uh, world, uh, you have to forget the past while remembering the details uh, and move on. So, okay, Ukraine has not been the best of India's friends, but times have changed. And uh, maybe this uh, role of ours or this help of ours will uh, uh, open a new chapter in Indo-Ukrainian relations when things settle down. Hmm. And and I, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think Biden really talks to Putin. I don't think they, they even communicate. At this present time, Prime Minister Modi seems to be the only major world leader who probably has a line to Putin wherein he can, apart from Xi, but Xi has, Xi has his own problems, but Xi or she or however you say it. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think uh, Prime Minister Modi is one of those, uh, you know, like you said, like stable international leaders who has a line to Putin. Uh, absolutely. And surely you recall that uh, recently when there was a meeting summit of SCO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization in um, uh, Samarkand, uh, President Putin, uh, when he met Prime Minister Modi, uh, the international headlines were that Mr. Modi suggested to 
President Putin that this is not the age of war. Mm. So that resonated throughout the world. And you are also right that Biden has not spoken to Putin, though there were mm. hints from various quarters that you know he can pick up the telephone and speak to him. Now, that is a very sad chapter of uh, diplomacy because, you know, even in the worst war situation, uh, leadership uh, has a responsibility to try and cool things down. And how do you cool things down? By picking up the t telephone and uh, talking to your counterpart. Uh, sure. had, had Biden done that, maybe things wouldn't have come to such a uh, pass. Maybe there won't have been so much destruction of life, property uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and maybe his own mistakes uh, would not have led Russia to this pass. After all, before February uh, of uh, this year, uh, Biden kept saying that, you know, I don't mind if, if Russia nibbles a bit of Ukraine. Now, you don't make statements like that and expect the other side not to be encouraged. And secondly, in November, uh, America and uh, Ukraine uh, sort of uh, discarded the Minsk agreement, which was the basis of understanding between Russia and Ukraine and the NATO countries, that NATO countries would not advance further eastwards. Uh, and that the territorial integrity and so on uh, uh, after Crimea would remain uh, as it is. So when you discard agreements, when you sort of openly say that you can nibble a bit of territory, I mean, that, that is not statesmanship. That, that shows that you uh, are not thinking ahead, but instigating the other side. And in February, almost on a daily basis, if not on a daily basis, every second day, Biden kept saying, Russia is going to attack uh, Ukraine in two days. Russia is going to attack Ukraine in three days or one day. Now, you do only countdown you do is when you're yeah. launching a space shuttle, not launching a war. I mean, that was bizarre uh, for Biden to say. So yes. I think he, he has made a mistake, major mistake, in not picking up the telephone and talking to uh, Putin. But mm. at the same time, it shows the quality uh, of leadership in Mr. Modi that he stepped in. Uh, I must also say that uh, uh, President Macron of France also made uh, a lot of effort initially, uh, not just with Zelensky, but also by going to Moscow and uh, sitting at the far end of a huge table uh, with Putin and to try and resolve or uh, bring down the temperature somehow. So Mr. Modi has now taken over from where some of the other leaders uh, left off. And uh, he's, he's doing it in a calm uh, and uh, responsible way uh, mm. by, by not being too aggressive about it, but at least suggesting that let's give peace a chance. Mm. I found that interesting also, Ambassador. You know, uh, Zelensky was very, did a lot of plain speak on his Twitter handle and said, look, we had this conversation. This is what we spoke about. This is what I expect. And he just kind of put it in a tweet and put it out in the world. The Indian side took a little time to react. Uh, maybe they didn't expect him to come out and just, you know, tweet the conversation out. Uh, but then they came out with, a, with what I thought was like a very careful reiteration of what the India's position has been all along. So you're right. It does come across as uh, India playing very, uh, very sort of calm and patient and even safe right now. I think we have to uh, also understand that Zelensky basically is a showman. He's an actor. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, even, even before the curtain uh, goes up, he, he wants his act to be noticed by everyone, if not by the audience, because curtain has not gone yeah. up, by the supporting staff and uh, you know, uh, the cleaners and so on. So what he is doing really is uh, showmanship at the highest level. And this showmanship has stood him well in terms of bringing along America and rest of the West uh, and towing uh, Zelensky's line 
right down to the T, though there are many flaws and stories are coming out of immense corruption and so on in Ukraine, but that's a different thing. So far, he has succeeded in making the Ukraine cause the Western cause or the NATO's cause. And uh, Biden simply uh, is floored by uh, his drama, his tears and his uh, uh, articulation of uh, the suffering that Ukraine and Ukrainians are going through, which is a fact. But, you know, uh, any other leader would not have been able to pull off this act in the way that Zelensky has done. So uh, I'm not surprised that he went to the town on uh, this telephone call. But yeah. the devil is in the details. The devil mm -hmm. is in the pinpoint formula that Zelensky presented to G20 in Indonesia. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, the other news that keeps coming up, and I know this gets into the territory of speculation, but there's all this talk about uh, Putin's health. Now, is this, is this you think, psychops by the Western <laughs> uh, arm of the world, or is there some truth to it? Well, quite frankly, I mean, I, I have no means of knowing whether he is in the pink of health or not. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, this is more of wishful thinking because mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they show his hand and that, you know, the, the, the means sort of coming out. Then they say that he is limping and then they say his right hand is stuck together to his body, which it always was because that yeah. is how a soldier operates. So, yeah. you know, uh, uh, every leader, when, when uh, he is of a certain age, and Putin is not exactly a teenager, would have maybe stomach cramps or a sore throat or whatever, and perhaps something more serious also. Uh, mm -hmm. is, it, is it not a fact that Biden does not know who the person he talked to a second back? He Sometimes he, he shakes hands in the air with non-existent persons. So... To say that Putin is about to die, I think, is uh, stretching imagination too far. Uh, so they have not now repeated those uh, speculative stories because they know that they were skating on thin ice and uh, there were no buyers for those, those uh, propaganda stories. And uh, the final question, Ambassador, how realistic is it uh, for India to play a role in such a, a complicated uh, conflict uh, in during its uh, presidency of the G20, that 10-point peace formula? Uh, will, it be, will we be able to make a difference? Will Prime Minister be able to push it along in some way? Uh, that was one question. And the second question is uh, the other scenario. You know, Is there a possibility that this could escalate and more countries could get involved in it? It's been nearly a year of this conflict that hasn't happened as yet, but uh, these things are so fragile that it could happen at any time. Well, firstly, India has a, a history of uh, sort of uh, helping out uh, countries reach a, a peaceful solution. Uh, in the 50s, it did so in Southeast Asia, particularly the Laos issue. Uh, so, uh, and the other thing I must point out is that there's a difference between mediation and good offices. Uh, mm. A country acts as a mediator when it has suggestions of its own, when it is intimately involved in the conflict between two countries and can bring them to table together with formulas of its own. That is not the case that India would... Uh, be getting involved with because mm. Russia and Ukraine uh, have two extreme views at the moment and uh, uh, particular ideas uh, we, we, in which India's role may not be uh, significant. But good offices is bringing two countries, conflicting countries together. That is what Zelensky has hinted at and that is what uh, other side may also be uh, wanting or, or willing to accept. I think Putin has also commented recently that he is open to talks. He has made, he has said that. Well, uh, I must introduce a note of caution. Uh, Putin saying that he is open to talks, he is willing to talk, uh, 
is a smart move mm. because should he say i want to keep on fighting i want uh, war to continue that's 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 not a wise statesmanship and putin is is a uh, experienced leader he's been there since the year 2000 and he's is uh, a clever negotiator so his saying that he wants peace he wants end of war is the right thing for any leader in any war situation to say unless you are a hitler or uh, someone like that mm. uh, second second thing is that zelensky also realizes that he's probably reached the end of his dramatic skills with the west because questions are being asked now in mm. washington and in some of the western capitals there were demonstrations a couple of weeks back in europe that you know in war why should we suffer a better winter because of uh, you know what is happening in ukraine so mm. as we go along in deeper winter and as costs escalate especially in europe uh, people would wonder why are we getting involved in this so zelensky's now approach to at least consider talks is based on the fact that there is a sort of fatigue war fatigue if you call it or conflict fatigue among his backers in the nato countries uh mm. whether that now coming to your second question whether that means the end of war is near i have my doubts because uh, zelensky's 10 conditions are quite extreme and mm. putin if he withdraws i mean one of the conditions being that russia should withdraw from all the territories it has uh, taken if you withdraw <laughs> crimea and all the rest uh, mm. then uh, it's it's a, it's a big let down for him uh, as it is russian army has not performed very well because of bad generalship and bad uh, logistics mm. now if he were to withdraw russians would ask him what are you doing Mm. No, absolutely. It's 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 uh, something worth considering. And uh, let's not forget the Americans are going to be heading into election year or the year before election, so their priorities are going to completely change, uh, which uh, I think even Zelensky would be aware of. And uh, we'll just see how this pans out in the new year. But thank you so much, Ambassador, for joining us and giving us uh, this time. I would love to have you back to talk about the TTP, really, because I feel like they're getting to be a problem uh, for Pakistan and uh, self-created problem, like most of Pakistan's problems. But uh, definitely something that we should discuss at uh, greater length. Thank you, Advaita. Always a pleasure. And you prepare so well for your show. that uh, is, is absolutely delightful to to and and uh, at times uh, i have to work hard to make sure that i i uh, do uh, the best in giving a satisfactory response no i'm just i'm just curious by nature so i keep reading a lot and <laughs> watching a lot of stuff so that's really where it comes from more than any kind of research but i really appreciate you breaking it down for us ever so often here and um, we'll hopefully have you back for the ttp because i think we really need to talk about them thank you thank you thank you so much thank you thank you everybody for watching do share like this video so more people watch it and of course subscribe to our channel thank you everybody have a great day and stay warm if you're in cold climes bye bye <laughs>